this point. Welcome, and of course we'll start with our bracha. Baruch Ata Adonai Loheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotav V'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah. Amen. I am looking for the... So we are on to the last parasha of Genesis, Vayichi, Vayichi. And this is where we left off last year. Uh, we may have dealt with this a little bit, but so we'll review it again. But uh, verse seven here. So uh, this is, of course, tells us Jacob's last years in Egypt. And uh, we will read here, we'll close the book of Genesis with the death of Joseph. Um, excuse me. Sure. I thought you said we were on the last Parsha. We it, are. There's okay. no verse seven and, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I don't see a verse seven in the last, are we in? 48, chapter 48. Take a look at chapter 48. Okay, so that's the, uh, the, the, Trying to, it's not the last Parsha, but maybe the second. Second to last, quite possibly. Yep. Wait, chapter 48? Yes, chapter verse 48. Seven? Say that again. Chapter 48, verse 7. That's what I have. That's. We um, didn't get very far. Yeah, that's. I'm trying to find it. It looks like it's the uh, first Parsha. Well, it's the first, yes, it's the first chapter of the Parsha, correct. 47, we're on chapter 47 or 48? 48. 48. Okay, that's the second chapter, but, because uh, there's a little bit of 47, but I found it, yeah, so it's in the um, first Parsha. Okay. Or are you thinking of the first Aliyah? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The All first, right. yeah, sorry. I want to sorry. know, Rabbi, why they embalmed, uh, do we believe in embalming uh, people or they embalmed uh, jo uh, Joseph? I don't understand that. You mean they embalmed Jacob? Jacob, rather, yeah. Yeah, no, we don't practice embalming. We we basically want the natural processes to to take place. And of course, embalming prevents that from happening. So it's a, it's a good question, Harlan. And um, first of all, they were going to transport him back to, you know, back to the land of Canaan. So they would have required some sort of, I imagine. Of course, the Egyptians did practice embalming. They, they perfected it as much as they did, uh, to the extent they did. Um, you know, I, I haven't read anything about it as such. Um, I would have to... You know, maybe I could put it under the category of circumstances, alter cases um, that you know, there's nothing specifically in the Torah that I know of that says you're not allowed to do it. Right. It's more a, an inference from, you know, from from dust you came into dust, you shall return. And the idea of making sure that you return, you know, as smoothly as possible. But it could be that it's more of a minhag than it is a halacha. Uh, and if it were a halacha, I imagine it might be rabbinic. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't done enough research on it to know to what degree it's it's it it needs to be enforced and stuff like that. I, I can't speak with authority about it. So it's just that we don't. I know that just like you do that we generally don't practice it, that we don't want to prevent the body from returning to its natural state. But in this particular case, there were different circumstances. I mean, they were going to be transporting Jacob's remains back to the land of Canaan. And so, and of course, that was the custom that they practiced in that country. What about uh, in, um, uh, cremation? Right. Um, I, again, I haven't, I'd have to go back and actually study it. My understanding of cremation, again, it's a good question, is that we don't practice cremation. Uh, that there's some strong there's some strong objections to cremation, as I understand. Um, there is actually a mystical. I think I've shared this before. That there's a mystical belief that we are present. That it takes time, and some of the mourning customs are based on the idea that the transition 
from our earthly life to our spiritual life takes time. It's a transitional time. And so the practices of Shiva and covering the mirrors and uh, those sorts of things uh, have to do with the fact that we are actually conscious and aware of what is going on around us. And while we are separated from our bodies, we still try to hold on as much as we can to life as it was before we, you know, our soul departed from the body. And so the soul is present in the house which is why the mirrors are covered, because if you were no longer in your body and you passed by a mirror and you saw nothing back, it would be a very shocking experience to you. And some of the, some of the stuff that's written in the mystical tradition uh, discusses the various stages that one goes through as you sort of transition from a physical form to a non-physical form. And the idea of watching yourself be burnt is a pretty horrible thing. So you, you're actually present at your funeral, which is again why during, uh, while, when the body is being prepared, the body is treated with tremendous respect, uh, because again, your soul is present at those particular moments. Uh, and I think that's at least one reason why you would not be cremated. Um, given the fact that so many Jews were cremated by the Nazis, uh, you know, you could take, you could argue both ways, uh, which is, you know, that, that in some ways you're identifying with this horrible thing that happened to your, your relatives and things like that. Uh, and on the other hand, of course, you could argue the other way, which is, you know, cremation is something even more wrong because of what the Nazis did. But you could argue that both ways. And that's what I know about it, basically. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't tell people what to do as far as that's concerned, unless they ask me my opinion. Uh, I know that cremation is practiced. There are people who believe that it's for the sake of the earth, you know, et cetera. And I'm not, you know, I really don't want to engage in those kinds of debates when people are having to deal with death and and they're in mourning and stuff it's not a time for these kinds of conversations if they ask me that's a different story but if they don't ask me i i will perform the funeral regardless and not enter these kinds of discussions okay mm -hmm. uh let's go on Vaani bevoimi padana ra mi padan and as for me, when I was coming from Padan, it's Padanaram, right, in, in Babylonia, where he was with Laban, Meta Alai Rachel Be'eretz Kna'an, uh, Rachel died Alai upon me, Be'eretz Kna'an, in the land of Canaan, by Derech on the way, as I, on the, during the journey. And I, I love, in a way, the expression in Hebrew, Meta Alai, in other words, the, the connotation there is how keenly he felt her death. That he was so, his soul was so interconnected with hers that um, when she died, it just left him grieving in a, in a serious kind of way. And there's a Talmudic proverb that says that a husband only dies for his wife and a wife only dies for her husband. Uh, and of course, it's describing the degree of grief and mourning that one senses if one is truly married to the other person. So that's that's the same uh, prefix that's uh, excuse me the same preposition that is used. Uh, why if, don't you okay. say why do you say Kaddish for such a short time for a spouse? Then? Good, good question. I understand. Um, it has, I think it has to do with the fact that when you are a child, um, you know, you are physically also so dependent on your, on your parent. And the other thing is that um, I think that your merit goes to them. So in other words, uh, as a child, if you act in a righteous way, your parents are given full credit for your righteousness. And so it helps them where they are in a spiritual place. And it's really, if you think about it, it's a, a profound 
expression of how linked our children are to to us. Um, I how read, about for a sibling? No, again, it's just a month. It's only a child that, that, that says Kaddish for 11 months. Uh, and the morning and the morning practice the month for a, a non, you know, a, not, a, a one who is not a child. Um, part of it, I think, had to do, um, I believe, had to do with in a case where so, for example, if a husband died, if a wife died and um, or, or a husband died and there were young children involved, you know, it was a lot. They had much larger families back then and the need to help with child rearing may have been a little bit of a different modality than it is for us and the way we do things these days. I know that uh, a woman was, was supposed to wait three months uh, just in case she was pregnant uh, and it wouldn't, you know, it started to show off to obviously they'd know who the father was of the child. Um, I believe that's how long uh, a woman was supposed to wait before she remarried and her husband had to wait at least a month i believe but again there was a you know there was a whole different attitude about child you know about families and child rearing and things like that than is prevalent in our society do you feel that answers the question judith or not I mean, it's a minimum, it's not a maximum, right? If a, if a husband or a wife, a spouse, you know, wanted, you know, needed to grieve for longer, they needed to grieve for longer. But there was also a sense that one should not exceed in grieving. You, you, you need to try and start to adjust, you know, just as soon as you can within reason. Well, adjusting and saying Kaddish don't, feel like the same thing but i do get that but i did say it for 11 months right and i think in your case it was appropriate i i don't think there are prohibitions from saying it i think it's rather saying this is the minimum requirement let's be honest is it okay for me to say there are people who don't say kaddish for one day okay so i mean yeah uh i think well we have to decide what what it really is what Kaddish is for? Is it for the person living or the for the person who has talked? So I, I think I can answer it's, the question. Right. Did you want to say more? I didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, no, uh, it's just that's the way I see it. I see it's for the person who is living because you're the one who's saying it. So you're the one who has to make that right. commitment. Right. And that's somewhat of a modern, you know, modernistic way of looking at things. It's the way we tend to see things as moderns. Mm -hmm. But the traditionally one is saying it for the deceased, that the whole custom is a story. I don't know where its origins are in the Talmud uh, or Midrash, but where uh, it had to do with um, someone having a dream about their father, that their father, as I recollect this, that their father was carrying a very heavy load. The father had, had died and the son had this dream that this father was carrying this very heavy load. Uh, and I somehow like Elijah appeared to him and told him that if he said Kaddish, uh, his fa the load would be lifted from his father. And, and that's sort of, it seems to me that those are the origins. So there's no question that at least from a traditional standpoint, you say Kaddish for the deceased. You say Kaddish to honor them and to, and that it's your, your what I said earlier on, uh, that it's your decision to act, to, to perform mitzvot, to act charitably, to do good deeds in the, in the hopes of helping that person on the other side of the divide. So, you know, um, that's just a very strong part of our tradition. So one really says all these morning things actually have to do with Kibbut Hamet. That's, we know that Kibbut Hamet, that is respect for the deceased, is the primary value involved in all the morning customs, a ways of showing respect for the deceased. And I think the truth is this, and ironically, that it's sometimes when we turn our attention away from ourselves and helping ourselves directly, that we actually help ourselves the most. That we that when we 
choose to try and help others and place our attention on others, uh, we tend to do the best for ourselves. And when you try to, I'm not saying always, but in general, the more you focus on yourself, the less help it becomes ultimately. Unless the focus is to look at, at seeing what mistakes you've made and to try and do chua, that's a different kind of focus. But, but sort of self, um, uh, what's it, you know, self-service, that kind of thing, even if it's benign, uh, I think one has to sort of take a, a measurement of that and, and try to make sure you balance it. We do have the famous Hillel statement, right? If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But on the other hand, it's balanced by, and if I'm for myself alone, then what am I? So there's that balance that one requires. And if not now, when? That's the third part. So it's a, it's a good maxim, obviously. Just sharing with you what I understand. We're going to go on with this. So just continuing with this verse, right? But od kivrat eretz lavo efrata. So there's some difficult Hebrew actually here. So the best translation that I can come up with offhand is with a short distance. Kivrat eretz is a, Rashi's going to go into this in some detail as to a, a specific measurement, right? But it basically means while there was still a short distance to be, to come to Ephrat, for Ekbera, Ekbereha Sham, and I buried her there, the Derech Ephrat, on the way to Ephrat, he Beit Lachem. And we're told that Ephrat and Beit Lachem, Beit Lechem, in other words, Bethlehem, are one in the same place. So... Let's, let's see what so we can she, do. She's not buried in Beit Lechem. She's buried oh, on the way. That, that is correct. That is correct. And Rashi is going to address that. He's going to address that. So, Vaani, as for me, Vavoimi Padanaran, when I came from Padan. So, Rashi sort of exploring the whole syntax of the sentence and what, what are the implications, the way Jacob is saying this. So, here we go. For Afalpi, Sha'ani matriach alecha. This is so interesting, right? Despite the fact that I am give, making you tr go to trouble, matriach alecha is to ask somebody to, to have to take trouble. Loholichani lehikaber be'eretz knad. So I'm putting you to the trouble of taking me to be buried in the land of Canaan. Ve'lokach asita le'imcha. And I didn't do that for your mother, despite the fact that I didn't do that for your mother. Here I am asking you to bury me in the land of Canaan. Shahare meta samuch Beit lechem, because she died close to Beit lechem. So um, let's keep going. So apparently where she is buried must be outside the land of Canaan. I'm going to assume by that. So even though Bethlehem may be in, in the land of Canaan, it appears as if uh, Jacob had not reached the land of Canaan yet. Okay, so here goes Rashi with Kivrat Aretz. Midat Aretz, it's a measurement of land. It's a land measurement. And he tells you exactly how much. Hem al Paim Ama, we are looking at 2,000 cubits. 2,000 cubits, um, a cubit, and nobody knows for certain exactly how much a cubit was, but basically a rule of thumb is about, about 18 inches. So you can figure it out. So 3,000 uh, 3, feet. Kamidat Tchum Shabbat. He says that is the measurement of Tchum Shabbat. Tchum Shabbat is the area outside of a city where you can walk. It's the distance past the boundary of the city that you're allowed to walk on Shabbat. So you're not supposed to do a lot of traveling on Shabbat. Uh, you're limited to 1,000 cubits beyond the, the city limits. Kedivre uh, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. This is according to, Rashi's referred to this teacher of his, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. 
uh, that's that's the distance that we're talking about. The Lord Tomar, and you cannot say, you cannot say, she ikvu alai geshamim miloholicha ole kabra the chevron. I, you know, there's no ex, there's no excuse. He's saying that the rains, the shamim, the rains prevented me from taking her and burying her in Hebron. And of course, Hebron is the cave of Machpelah. And and there is a an irony uh, in the fact that here we know for a fact that Jacob loved Rachel above all his wives, and nevertheless, she's not buried with him in Hebron. And so that raises the question as to why she isn't. So, also, he, why if if what about Eruvim? Yes, yes. Why do you need an Eruv if there's already a limit outside of a city? So that that's a very good question. We're talking here about an Eruv. There is a different kind of Eruv, which is called Eruv Tchumim. So the Tchum is the that distance beyond the city limits that you're allowed to travel. So that's what I'm saying, because yeah, like, yeah, let's yeah. say you're in New York City. Why do you, if you're in New York City, you're within the city. Why yes, do you need an Eruv? So this, it's a different kind of Eruv. That's a different kind of Eruv. The, and the word Eruv really means blending. That's what the word is. So like Eruv, the evening, it's a blend of day and night. That's why it's called Eruv. And there's different kinds of Eruvim, the difference. There's, for example, this Eruv Tavshilin, where what you do is you blend food in such a way that you can prepare food. If Yontif falls Erev Shabbos, okay, you can cook food on Yontif in a way that you can't on Shabbos. But on the other hand, when you cook food on Yontif, the rule is you can only cook the food that you require for Yontif. So if Shabbos is the day after Yontif, you're now technically unable to cook for Shabbos on Yontif. But if you make an Eruv, you take some of the food and you declare that you're doing it for the sake of Shabbat as well, you can cook that food on Yontif for Shabbat. That's a specific kind of Eruv. The Eruv that you're talking about where you can carry things around is not the Eruv of Tchumim. It's a different kind of Eruv. And what it's essentially doing, and this is my understanding, and it's possible that I'm wrong about it, is it's, a, it's actually quite technical. And it has to do, I believe, with the fact that what you're, you're allowed to carry in a private domain, but you're not allowed to carry in a public domain. There is a third domain, which is called the exempt domain, uh, which doesn't fulfill all the requirements of either of the other two. It doesn't fulfill the requirements of a public domain or a private domain. And the rabbis created a fourth domain called a Carmelite, which has all the strictures of both public and private domains. You, you're not supposed to transfer from one domain to another. And as I said, you're not allowed to carry in a public domain on Shabbat. What the rabbis did was by setting up some kind of demarcation, they, I believe, were able to make a Carmelite into a private domain. You are allowed to carry in a private domain. I did warn you that this is technical. And, and by creating that Eruv, you're now allowed to carry. It's different, okay? It's a different, uh, it's an Eruv uh, Mavui, it's a Mavui and a Shituf, other kinds of Eruvim. The specific Eruv that we're talking about here is Eruv Tchumim. And this is what you do essentially, is you set up your 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 domicile for Shabbat technically at the eleven at the end of the thousand or the two thousand amot. Okay, uh, and what you're able to do is then you're allowed to carry from the city limit to in that direction to where you've established your uh, domicile for Shabbat another two thousand cubits. So in other words, that you can now, if you want to, for example, for the sake of a mitzvah, go and visit a Torah scholar who's speaking in a town that's past 2,000 cubits up to 4,000 cubits. In another town, you can now do that.
Um, if you don't fully understand what I'm talking about, I cannot blame you. It helps to have illustrations of this, but essentially that's the area you're talking about with the Tchum Shabbat. Do you have well, who, any? Uh, yes. Who places the, uh, uh, that particular, what if this breaks and you don't know it broke? No, no, no. Okay. We're no longer talking about a wire or something like that. We're talking about food enough food for Shabbat. That's the way oh. you establish your domicile, is that you set aside enough food for two meals in that particular location. Oh. Listen, uh, if, you're, if you're being, if you're confused and having difficulty, it means you're paying attention. Uh, one of the most <laughs> difficult tractates in the entire Talmud is the tractate Eruvin. There's a tractate by that name that, that deals solely with these particular topics. And it's very, it's a difficult tractate. Hmm. Well, if you live in an apartment and, and it's a uh, hallway there, but everybody goes mm -hmm. in. Okay, yes, that is a different kind of a roof. That's again, that has to do with the fact of the mavui, of a, of a, of a um, passageway or something like that. Right. Yeah. It's a different kind of roof. I, I, you know, we're taking a lot of time on this. It's almost eight o'clock, and we've not discussed really much of the verse at all. So, I mean, it's, they're legitimate questions. They have to do with, you know, uh, understanding a mitzvah, and uh, that's it's a very interesting area and also very complicated. So, I'm, I am going to take a moment to see if I can get a little bit further on this. So basically what Jacob is doing is saying to Joseph, I have this big favor to ask you. You have every right to tell me that, you know, that I didn't act in that way. Why should you act in that way? You know, it's, it's not going to be do as I say and don't do as I do. Right. I mean, you, you do as you do. You set up an example. So he's saying, I cannot use that excuse. Right. You can't I can't say, well, it was the rainy season, so I couldn't I couldn't set out to bury her in Hebron. He says, Eight Hagrid Haya. It was actually the time when the surface of the fields was parched. Shaharitz Halula Uminukevit Kakavura. He says, it was even though it wasn't the rainy season, I'm not going to use that as the excuse. It actually is the dry season, but at that particular play time. The earth is sort of perforated like a sieve. A kavara is a sieve. So this is, you know, I, I, this wasn't a simple Rashi for me because it's like he's saying, well, look, I'm not using this one excuse because generally speaking, you know, it's a very difficult time to travel uh, when it's the rainy season. And that's why we don't have uh, the pilgrim festivals during the rainy season. You think about it, right? Pesach is the end of the rainy season. Shavuot follows uh, seven weeks later. And Sukkot is the beginning of the rainy season. So essentially, it's, it's not, a, not difficult to travel at that time. And this was a serious consideration back then when, they, when travel, you didn't have a car to travel in. It, it was much more open. Uh, so, but on the other hand, is he saying here, I had a difficult, pro I had a different problem. Is that what he's saying here? And uh, it's sort of interesting why he needed to mention that. So maybe that is what he's saying, you know, that despite oh. the fact that it wasn't the rainy season, I still oh. would have had difficulty. Yes. This points out, I mean, my, it points out specifically that where it says stretch of land, it's the yes. same kind of the same word as the words of that was full of holes like a sieve. Yes. A sieve. yes. So I think that's what precipitated the comment. But right. also, is that word related to the word for to, for uh, grave or am I getting confused? No. That, that, that word is spelled with a kuf, not with a Okay. Kuf. Right. So kever meaning a grave is with a kuf. Okay. Yes. So that that is true. So just to point that out, thank you, Lauren. I think that's important that that the reason why he's using Kivrat Eretz is a way of short way of saying that the land was filled of there's the word Kave, Kave, Kaveira, a sieve. Okay. Uh, the Ikabra Sham or Ekbarash Sham, sorry, I buried her there. And he's saying, I didn't even take her to Bethlehem. 
להכניסה לארץ, in order to bring her into the land. V'yadati, but he knows, the reason he didn't, he's giving an explanation, he's explaining to Joseph that there was a reason for him not to do it. V'yadati, sheyesh belibcha alai, he says, I know in your heart you have this against me, you, you held this against me. Avaldalacha, but please know, please know, you should be, no. That it was because God commanded me to bury her there, right outside the land of Canaan. It wasn't my idea. It was because God told me I had to do it. Why? And this is beautiful, actually. So that she could assist her, her descendants when Nebuzaradam would send them into exile, right? We're looking at the destruction of the first temple. Excuse me, one second. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and when the, the, the population was exiled, pretty much lock, stock and barrel to Babylonia, right? So they were, this is when Nebuzaradan would send them into exile. Nebuzaradan was the general Nebuchadnezzar's general, Vahayu, going on, Vahayu of Rim Derech Sham. And that was, they, they had to pass that location on their way, uh, on their way into exile, on their way to Babylonia. They had to pass right. her too. Um, yeah. Just briefly, um, yeah. Chabad says that it wasn't outside the land, but it was outside the inhabited region of the Holy Land, according to Siftei Chachamim. Okay, so thank you, Lauren. So again, the fact that we need Siftei Chachamim to clarify that shows that it's not so clear. Okay, so um, I, 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 obviously I, I can't argue or this, this requires, you know, a great deal of uh, research to, to come up with that. But, you know, Chabad is a pretty authoritative, they have good, good scholars working on this. So then they're telling you on the basis of who. Yeah, so the point is this, that, okay, so either the fact that he didn't bring her into, into that inhabited region, uh, that that was important, that she was buried outside of it, or whether it was the land of Canaan itself. Um, I'm, I'm happy to accept Chabad's interpretation and basically Siftei Chachamim's interpretation. Regardless, it's saying she was not buried in the most honorable way. So here we go now. So we, we we left it at the Israelite. The you know the the people are being sent out to Babylonia. Yatzat Rachel al Kira. So Rachel went out of her tomb. Uvocha umavakeshet. So it's he puts it in the present tense, in the imperfect tense, right? That Rachel goes out of her tomb. Uvocha and she is crying. She's weeping. And she is praying to God to have mercy on them. And this is this quote from Jeremiah 31. Kol barama nishma, a voice is heard in Rama, the Gomer, etc. So this is it goes specifically on to say Rachel seeking mercy for her for her descendants. And, and the verse goes on to say, responds to her, the Holy One, Blessed he responds to her, that says, There is merit, there is benefit for, for what you do, Neum Hashem, saith the Lord, etc. And basically uh, ends by saying, And the children will return to their borders. So basically taking this all together, Jacob is saying to Joseph, it's so that your mother is going to be able to help our descendants in the future. It's important that she is there. Uh, and again, there's a lot of symbolism involved here and this this stuff to unpack, uh, which I'm not doing, but just this, the in a sense, the drama and the pathos 
involved in this statement from Jeremiah and how Rashi is applying it right here in this conversation that Jacob is having with his son. For Unculus Tirgame, Kruv Ara. Okay, so Unculus translates this as uh, a distance, Kadeshi Ur. So this is a, an expression in Aramaic that, re, that, that represents the distance of one day's plowing, of a day's plowing. Sfarim uh, Achirim, this is saying other manuscripts apparently have harishat eretz, okay, that it's the plowing of land, or maybe harishat yom eretz, something like that, I don't know, for sure. For Omer Ani, however, Rashi is saying, I'm of the opinion, Shahayalahem Ketsev, that in fact there was a fixed measurement, just like we talk about a mile or a foot, etc. This is Kivrat Eretz, is a fixed measurement, Shayu Korin Oto, that they referred to it, Kede Maharishat Achat, he says, the distance of one plows in the course of a day, that that was a a um, specific length. And here he's got this French word. Uh, Lauren, you may have uh, an English uh, application of, of what this word is. Okay. Choriad, chor, I don't know. A chord? I know there's a measurement actually called a chord in, in, a, in French. Kedamrinan, as we say, is a statement in the Talmud that says, Krov Vatani, it says, plow it twice, right? Plow and a second time. And then another one, Kama de Mesik Ta'ala, the amount that a fox picks up, Mibe Karva, on its feet in from a plowed field. So apparently that's another, it sounds like another measurement, an amount that we're talking about. And we're going to stop right here. And uh, thank you. So I'm going to st stop the share, sorry, and stop the recording.